Well, it never ceases to amaze me how the Holy Spirit shows up. Maybe one of these days I'll quit being surprised at how sometimes things just come together in just the right way. As you know, if you've been around the last couple of weeks, we've been telling stories about how community matters and how you personally experience the importance of this community in your own life. And our resident associate, Katie Smith, has been managing that little project, and I never see the stories until they come to me for a final okay. So imagine my joy this week as I'm working on my sermon entitled Leadership Matters around a story where Jesus feeds people that Katie shows up in my office having dug up this video of Beth and Sheridan from last spring about feeding people and about getting fed here at community. I was giddy. And then she brings me Jan Markison's written submission, and I nearly fell out of my chair. If you didn't read it yet in this week's newsletter, it's reprinted in your bulletin, Jan's article is. Now, don't get it out and read it right now. I saw some of you reach. I saw you. I saw all of you. Yeah, you can read it this afternoon when you get home, put it back in your purse. You see, for both of them, they were stories of people stepping up to lead, recognizing a need, and rising to the challenge to help meet it. That, my friends, is leadership. So thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, great associate. Because these two stories have been a perfect complement to our scripture. A scripture story that is a very, very important one in the Jesus narrative. You see, this story of the feeding of the multitudes, I don't call it the feeding of the 5,000, right? Because there were 5,000 dudes, plus women and children, right? So many more. Feeding of the multitude story is found not just in Matthew's gospel. It is found in all four gospel stories. It is the only Jesus story that is found in all four of the gospels. Not the birth story, not the resurrection story, not any other story, this feeding story. It's not only found in all four of the gospels, it's repeated in the very next chapter here in Matthew, and it's also told twice in Mark. So this story must have been critical to the early church. And it should also be important to us here today. Now, the stories are not all the same. The four stories are not. Did anybody catch what might have been missing from this story? Did anybody miss any particular character in this story? Maybe like a small boy whose mother packed him a lunch? right? Not in this story. The small boy whose daddy packed him a lunch only shows up in John's story. Now, the thing that shows up in this story is maybe my favorite Jesus line in all of Scripture. You see, the thing I love and the reason I like to preach this version of this story is that when the disciples identify the problem, this problem of hungry people, they suggest to Jesus that he send the people away. Clearly, they are too overwhelmed by the situation. And yet, Jesus challenges them. Did you catch what he said? He says, you give them something to eat. my favorite Jesus line. And it comes because of the disciples. I have to tell you, I love how the scripture writers 
describe the disciples, not just in this story, but in lots of stories. They are not always the sharpest pencils in the drawer. I am grateful that Jesus chose a bunch of nimwits to be his best friends and closest followers. Because you see, so many times, not just in this story, they don't get it. They're kind of like me a whole lot of the time. They want the easy way. And they're slow to pick up on what Jesus is getting at. And so often I imagine Jesus shaking his head at them and somewhat exasperatedly saying, for heaven's sakes, give them something to eat. It's like you want to say to these guys, have you all not been listening? Have you all not been participating in the last 13 chapters of this story? Did they really think that Jesus was just going to send these hungry people away? Now, how many times do we find ourselves in a situation like the disciples in this story where we see and identify a problem or a need and then we expect someone else to take care of it? Or we pray for someone else to, God, somebody really needs to come and work on this problem. And God says, yes, yes, they do. And you say, oh, someone will surely step up and take care of that. Well, I couldn't possibly do that. Or the situation is just too overwhelming, and we don't even know where to begin with that one. And then Jesus shows up in Jesus' Jesus-y way and says, you give them something to eat. And then Jesus goes one step further to model for us how to live it out. Identify the problem, take what you have, make it work. This isn't just about following Jesus. The story, the Jesus narrative begins to change, I think, here in chapter 14 of Matthew's Gospel, because this just isn't about following Jesus anymore. This is about becoming an active participant in the Jesus work that is happening. And that's called leadership. Jesus couldn't possibly do all this work by himself. And if he did, then the disciples would be completely and utterly useless after he was gone, and then what would happen? Jesus knew that their leadership mattered. Identify a need, take what you have, make it work. What needs are you seeing here at Community Christian Church? And what might you have that can help us make it work? I mentioned last week about all the saints who I've seen stepping up and participating in the life of our community. And it's been really exciting for me. About two weeks ago, there was an email exchange between the chair of the deacons and the chair of the elders, the chair of our worship team, and the person who tends to coordinate the communion servers for this 1030 service. And they decided they wanted to sit down and streamline how people get scheduled into volunteering for worship. As one of them said, if we coordinate our efforts, we can work smarter rather than harder. I was so happy. Now, I refrained from inserting myself into this email thread, and some of you know that was a real challenge for me. But I did, because I just wanted to see how this got played out, and it got played out beautifully. They saw a need. They figured out what they had. They made it work. They work together. And let me tell you, by the time these four people are done, you better get out of the way, because this is going to be a well-oiled machine. I am so excited. That, my friends, is leadership. But those are needs that they saw. But leadership is needed in other ways, too. Leadership happens when people step up to prepare and serve communion. Do you have something that you can help with that way? Four or five times a year, helping to serve communion? We're putting a new list together. 
We're glad to have you on it. Leadership happens when we have people step up to help in the office a few hours a week. Leadership happens when you see a face in worship maybe that you don't know and you step up to introduce yourself. Leadership happens when you help the senior minister write birthday cards to everybody in the church because she thinks that's really important and you have beautiful handwriting and still think that a handwritten card matters to people. See how I asked you for that? Leadership matters. But here's the thing. Here's the Jesus thing. The Jesus thing is it's not just that you lead. The Jesus thing is how you lead. Maybe you've seen the story of Dirk Voltz circling the internet this week. This guy lives in Berlin, and over the last several months, he and his husband have hosted 24 Syrian, Afghan, and Iraqi refugees in their home. And he posted their reflections on that this week. And in one interview on BuzzFeed, he said they simply refused to look away or continue to whine about the crisis. He explains, and I quote, that what happened this summer and this fall has changed our lives. This is my favorite part. You can be there for other people or you can be scared. And if that happens, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for those who live in fear, end quote. That's leave, living out Jesus' challenge to give them something to eat. And leading in a Jesus kind of way. You can lead in lots of different ways. There are lots of leadership styles and models. You see it in churches and elected officials. But Jesus' style of leadership challenges us to lead out of a place of love and compassion. Jesus in this story challenges the disciples' notion of leading from a place of fear and anxiety. That's their starting place. Anxiousness, so many people, Jesus. Fear, send them away. However, Jesus turns that on its head and says, well, what does it look like if we lead with love? And that's what Jesus challenges us to do. Love for the gathered community. Love for those in need. Love for his disciples, these beloved friends of his that he wanted so desperately to be better and to do better. He wanted them to be the very best version of themselves so they could help the world be its best version too. Now, so often we get sidetracked in this story. We get caught up that this story is supposed to be about this magic trick that Jesus performs. Right? Well, you know, people argue about, well, did Jesus really feed a multitude of people? How did Jesus really do that? And we could argue about it all day. But if we do that, we miss the point, I think, or at least one of the many points of this story. Marianne Williamson says, a miracle is a shift in perception from love, from fear to love. I'll say it again. A miracle is a shift in perception from fear to love. Yes, indeed, this story is about a miracle. A miraculous shift in perception from fear into love. The screensaver on my laptop has been the same for many years now. Three words. I choose miracles. I choose miracles. Not I believe in miracles because there's a difference. Friends, when we choose miracles, we commit ourselves to help making them a reality in the world. 
we commit ourselves not to just being followers of Jesus, but active participants in divine work in the world. Friends, this morning, Jesus challenges us to choose miracles. You give them something to eat. Today we have a challenge and an opportunity. I, for one, choose miracles. I choose to participate in making them happen in this community and in this world. And I hope that we as a community will say the same so that we can be a community that matters and a community that makes miracles happen. Amen.